the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show, we have engineer Jason McPhee and water use efficiency consultant Fred Rouse. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're on the air at WWW Access Sacramento, Channel 17 in Sacramento, uh, and uh, cable channels all over the place as well as YouTube. So welcome to the show wherever you are. Uh, 8 p.m. Thursdays, uh, noon on Fridays, and 4 a.m. on Saturdays, all Pacific time. The Republican Obamacare repeal and replace what a debacle. Fred? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Trump, the braggadocious one, um, had his ego so wrapped up in um, passing something, anything. I don't think he knew what he was trying to pass. I don't Nor think did anybody in Congress. Nobody in Congress Other knows. Than a couple of people who wrote there's, it. There's, seems to be a tremendous amount of difficulty, not just in Congress, but in this country as a whole, acknowledging that, I mean, the problem we have with health care is that we just use way too damn much of it. Um, and so the way that we're going to solve our health care problem is to use less of it, because it's more than we can afford, especially as the population ages and all of the services get more and more expensive. Now, there's, there's a number of ways that you can approach this. Individually, you could you know, get your treatment in Mexico, for example, or Costa Rica or Thailand or India, and a lot of people are doing that. Um, but the way the system's set up right now, we're kind of required um, to have insurance, more out of fear than anything. It's kind of a fear-based thing. But the way to reduce our consumption of health care, there's two ways you can do it. You can ration care, which is what would happen if we went to a single payer system like's happened with the national health care in, in the UK and most other countries that have nationalized single payer health care. Oh, and the there's, Veterans Administration. There's, this, and there's rationing that's going to have to occur because there's, you, know, you can't give everything to everybody. Or the option, the libertarian option, is to have people pay for their own health care and to use less. Now, there's a number uh, yeah, of you're ways. talking about the demand side when you're talking right. about using less. Using less. I'm talking about demand. The, the bottom line is we have to get, we have to lower the demand for health care in this country. Now, it's a huge industry behind the, you know, government and the military industrial complex and the intelligence complex. Health care is, you know, 19% of our economy. You got all these doctors and you got all these nurses and everybody loves to love their doctor and nurses are sweet and they all just want to help us. Well, they're all getting paid a fair amount of money. And the pharmaceutical companies and the hospital chains and the insurance companies get their cut. I mean, it's just incredibly expensive. So now you're talking about the demand side. You, you, you're, you brought, you're bringing up now the supply side. And going back to the 1920s, uh, there were dozens and dozens more medical schools than there are today. At the urging of the American Medical Association, the most effective union in history, most of those medical schools were shut down thereby, and, and the admission standards for the ones that remained were tightened up dramatically, resulting in a, in a uh, rationing on the amount of doctors that are out there. Same things happened with nurses, same things happened with uh, hospitals. If you want to open a hospital, you have to, get a, you have to file a certificate of necessity uh, application in most states, which is probably not going to get granted because, after all, the uh, existing hospitals will say, well, your hospital is not necessary. We're, doing just, we're handling the demand just fine. Uh, go away. So you've got a restriction on the demand side, or on the supply side, of, of medical care practitioners and facilities. And for, there's a reason the doctors in the United States make two to five times as much money as doctors in other developed countries. And it's because it's we have restricted the supply. the supply dramatically. And we've been doing it for over a century. Right. And uh, uh, surgical procedures and chemo treatment and whatever it is you need can be purchased overseas in places that provide equal quality of care for you know, less than 50% of the cost. Well, yeah, I didn't and, even mention the drug companies. The drug right. companies have uh, essentially cartel-like uh, market power for the, you know, because of the uh, patent and copyright system, or patent system. And, uh, you know, we're not necessarily against patents, but the way the patents are being used and abused in this country uh, gives large drug companies the ability to make a tweak in an existing medication and the doctor will, will, will now prescribe the new medication which is going to cost a, a whole lot more than the, uh, the off-patent medication which probably does exactly the same thing. There's also two, uh, two other problems I think with this whole thing. One is the Republicans talked about repealing this for the longest time but 
their message was was pretty much incoherent. It was Obamacare bad, but we got something else for you in store. But you know, it's 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 going to be related maybe to single payer, maybe to universal, and that was the problem. I mean, you know, Trump is essentially the figurehead at the moment, and he's been all over the board on this. I mean, he has. He has praised single payer at times. He has, uh, you know, promoted the idea of universal health care at times, and that really kind of brings up the problem. If if you're a voter, you know, what what do you, what do you what's the message you're getting? You're not really being told what the real solutions are. It's just don't worry, we have some mystery solution that's a little bit better than than what these guys have. But what the real thing is is that prices are dead essentially as far as price signals. Prices are invisible. Exactly, and so we don't know how yeah, much it costs because we're not paying for it, so we don't care. So we exactly. consume it when we think we need it. I think if people were to pay either through much higher deductibles, I think it's a good way to go. Higher deductibles and cheaper catastrophic policies. They first of all they demand pricing information. Second of all, they take better care of themselves. I mean, most of the problems in this country are preventable through lifestyle choice. I mean, you can say there's a lot of people that got dealt a bad hand. We're not all the same, obviously. Some people are, have the genes that predispose them to heart disease or kidney disease or whatever. But type 2 di diabetes is a lifestyle disease. As I'm is sorry. heart disease, as is high blood pressure, as is, uh, are a number of other diseases. All these things can be The libertarian dealt with. message really needs to be repeal and deregulate. Get right. rid of the cartels that uh, control the number of doctors that are in practice. Get rid of the illegal cartels that are uh, controlling what are making it possible for drug companies to uh, levy monopolistic uh, price, price schemes. Get rid of the, uh, the cartels that make it uh, possible for the nurses to uh, threaten to strike and shut down the, the health system in large hospitals. Get rid of the cartels that limit the number of hospitals. Make the supply be what it would be in any other line of business. Uh, you know, supply rises to meet demand. And uh, as far as the insurance portion of it, we're not really talking about health care here. We're talking about an insurance model. Well, an insurance model is for unforeseen circ circumstances. There's nothing unforeseen about getting a flu shot or about getting a vaccine or about uh, going to the doctor for sniffles. That's foreseen. Those are things that are going to happen all the time. The only thing that we should be getting insurance for are major medical and accidents. Yeah, exactly. traumatic injury is what our medical system is good at and that's why I keep my insurance, although I've thought many times about dropping it because it's so darn expensive and the price keeps going up and I never use it. But if I were in a car accident or if I were on a hike with you and I fell off a cliff, I sure as heck would want to go to the hospital and get patched up. You know, and that would be hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably. Sure. But to add on to what Richard's saying, too, I mean, we don't insure anything else this way. I mean, we don't insure our houses this way. We don't say, oh, I need a uh, to fix a few boards on my fence. Well, let's go call the insurance company. You know, we we call the insurance company generally when we have something that, that is a high unforeseen cost. And and yet we're trying to, to use insurance to, to pay for everything like it's a buffet. And that's that's really the crux of the problem. We don't use the insurance company to pay for oil changes on our car. Exactly. Car it's just, you know, the, the whole model is insane uh, and needs to be changed. We need to separate the idea of insurance from the idea of health care deregulate health care to the greatest extent possible and, uh, and get the insurance companies the heck out of it. So. And yeah, and if, if you say, okay, if you're a person that believes that health care is a right and everybody should have it and everybody have to, has, you know. Well, it's not. Which, I mean, that's, 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 you're walking down the road to, to government control. You're walking down the road to rationing. You're walking down the road to rules on what you can and cannot eat or ingest in any way, smoke, drink, whatever. If that's what you want, Look, man, if I'm paying for it, I say no more sugar for you, period. Well, I mean, I, the, the whole thing about that is if you're talking about health care as a right or a, or a single payer, well, a single payer is a single decider. Yeah. Uh, they're going to decide whether or not to cover you uh, in your last uh, hours. That's and, happening. And it's, that, that Charlie Gard case in England is a perfect example of that. And it's one, uh, it's one size fits all, too. You don't yeah. get to choose an alternative. You know, if you're talking treatment. about single payer, think about the DMV or think about 
other government-run monopolies, the post office, the DMV are the ones that they, they most quickly come to mind. Do you really enjoy standing in line at the DMV or at the post office? I don't think so. Well, and that's where it really gets down to. You have to have some way to ration scarce goods in society, and if you don't do it with price, which is the way markets do it, then you're going to have to do it with some kind of either a lottery system or a line or, or, so, or you know, potentially some leader deciding who gets what. Yeah. Single, Those payer, are, single decider, and it's not you. Yeah. Right. Uh, vaccines, is that something that yeah. should be covered by, uh, by, uh, by health care under any circumstances and should, it be, should, should they be required? I think the, um, my concern with the vaccine argument is um, the, the whole discussion, vax, anti-vax, there are people that are opposed to vaccines because they believe that they're not safe and not effective. And as a result, um, they're demonized uh, by the medical profession, by government officials, and by all kinds of people who are, in my opinion, brainwashed with the idea that vaccines are only good and never bad. There's an increasing, and, and in the state of California, we're one of three states nationwide, and I'm not, Mississippi is another state, and I'm not sure what the third one is, but we require children to have the full CDC schedule of vaccines at kindergarten, seventh grade, and twelfth grade, I think, in order to attend school. And these um, the vaccine schedule has increased dramatically from about, about 18 doses in 1986 to up to 60 doses by age six, 64 doses by age six now. Um, the interesting thing that I think everybody should know about vaccines is that the vaccine industry is almost alone. I think the nuclear industry has a similar relationship with government, but they are completely indemnified. They're completely held harmless by the government for any injury caused by any of their products as of 1986. So they basically have, they cannot be taken to court. There's no discovery in the case of, there's a separate vaccine court set up, administered by the government. It's very difficult to get your case heard, very high standards, very few people are paid that are injured, although we pay $3 billion a year out to vaccine injured people. But there's no incentive whatsoever for the vaccine manufacturers to make a safer product. And if you're a doctor, a pediatrician, and you've been administering vaccines all your life, and you've been told that they're safe and effective, it's very hard to admit, to come to the realization, to do the work to find out that there are indeed serious concerns about the safety of vaccines. In recent years, there's been an increasing amount of research, most of it done in other countries. Brazil, Mexico, and Italy come to mind in particular. I'm sorry, not Brazil, Mexico. Brazil, Israel, and Italy. Israel is where they're doing most of the research that um, links um, immunization or vaccinations to autoimmune disorders. And it only makes sense when you think about it. I mean, a vaccine is there to hyperstimulate your immune system. So what they've come up with is basically there are certain haplotypes, which are genetic markers on the surface of people's cells that are susceptible to whether it's multiple sclerosis or lupus or scleroderma or just allergies or asthma. All of these things are a hyperstimulated immune response. Some people are more susceptible to that because of their genetic makeup. But these injuries that occur during vaccination, and it is an insult to your body when you take an injection, um, these injuries are cumulative. It stimulates your immune system. The biggest problem, and, and this is all emerging right now, it's coming up fast, and you guys are all gonna know about this in a year or two. The biggest problem is the aluminum adjuvants that are used in the vaccines. They're nanoparticulate aluminum hydroxide and aluminum phosphate, and these things are eaten up by your white blood cells at the injection site, and they're, they're not excreted like when you eat aluminum. It quickly dissolves, and it's excreted in your urine, and it only 0.3% is absorbed in your digestive tract. But when it goes into your muscle, those macrophages, your white blood cells, eat it up, those nanoparticles, and it is transported throughout your body. It stays in your body for a long time, and it collects in your brain. Alzheimer's emerging. Anybody? There's a lot of emerging research and it's not publicized in this country. You won't hear this here because we've got Big Pharma is uh, one of the major advertisers and the major, they, they spend twice as much on lobbying Congress as any other industry. And they spend a ton of money advertising on, in the mainstream media. You won't hear about this stuff very, very often because there's liability all down the line. Your doctor doesn't want to hear about this. 
There are doctors out there that say, wow, if you have concerns, come see me. You can get a medical exemption for your child in the state of California. You have to say, I've got a family history or a known genotype that predisposes me towards allergy or autoimmunity, and you can get an exemption. You don't have to vaccinate your kid. The whole argument about, well, if you don't vaccinate your kid, then my kid's going to get sick. B.S. If the vaccine works, the vaccine works. Go ahead and take it. Do it. Go ahead. But we need to be educated. I'm trying to do that right now. There are definite dangers and it's not gonna hurt everybody. I mean, my kids were fully vaccinated and they're fine. It doesn't hurt everybody, but it hurts a lot of people. And there's a lot of brain injury. There's a lot of seizure disorders. There's a lot of autoimmunity. There's demyelination, you know, rain. There's all kinds of bad stuff that can happen as a result of immune hyperstimulation from vaccines. So and in you're, particular, you're equating uh, the uh, whole vaccination process to the received wisdom, sort of like the Middle Ages, it was uh, okay to bleed people. That was the uh, established right. cure, right? Is that, what you're, is that the argument that you're I mean, making? the theory is good, but okay. when you hear... So, so in other words, there might, be, there might be good theory about it, but there might be bad side effects. Right. If I was going to Africa to a really dirty place where I was going to be exposed to a lot of stuff my body hadn't been exposed to before, and knowing that I'm not an allergic person and I don't have an autoimmune disorder, I would get vaccinated before going. Well, and I'm going to that. Africa, and I got myself vaccinated. Right. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna, you know. I'll right. I mean, I it's a it's a risk benefit trade off, yeah. and for some people, the risks are much higher than they are for other people, and right. so it's not a one size fit all fits all thing. And that's what they've been telling us: everybody gets the same shots. Doesn't matter what diseases run in your family doesn't matter if you reacted poorly to the first time you got the dpt shot you still have to get the second one and the third one it's just it's there's no risk benefit analysis going on it's the argument is shut down in most of the mainstream press and that's not reality well you know well one other thing too i mean just just thinking historically vaccines have done some good with things like polio and and uh, other serious diseases, but I, I think the libertarian or, or more of a free market way to do this is to try to remove the distortions and just let the natural experiments happen. If people decide to let people be free to discriminate and if they want to hang out with other people who are vaccinated and if other people want to go hang out, that will be the best signal for people to make those choices on So you're own. saying scarlet letter, pink triangle, whatever? I, I'm I mean, saying yeah. that's the freedom to discriminate right. that we as sure. libertarians should be promoting. And the idea is that a business, a daycare can say, well, we want to see a card, or another daycare can say, you know, we don't. We think that's a lot of nonsense, and we really don't want to to have the vaccinations here. So you could have that sure. occurring, and that would be the signal for everybody else. Uh, Free you know, choice, not libertarian, sure. exactly. not libertarian uh, I, angle. I don't want to imply any um, any mal malevolence or on the part of the pharmaceutical companies or the medical complex, but vaccinations generate a tremendous amount of downstream revenue. When the safety studies are done on these things, they're, they look at people for weeks or maybe a month. A lot of these immune problems sh don't show up until a year, two years later, and it's cumulative. And all, I mean, autoimmune disorders have exploded in this country in the last 20 years. Whether you're talking about the ones I mentioned before, scleroderma, lupus, multiple sclerosis, you know, chronic fatigue, there's a, a list of a hundred or more autoimmune disorders and these things are expensive to manage and they're debilitating and we're creating a population we're a sick country man it's not just diabetes and high blood pressure there's a lot of sick people in this country witness the uh, disability rates right uh, speaking of uh, of uh, sick situations we have a sick uh, immigration uh, system already it's sick trump is uh, talking about improving it or making it even worse. He's talking about having, cutting in half, legal immigration. Good thing, bad thing, what do you think? I personally think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of these things where, you know, immigration should, you know, if we could remove the malincentives, you know, if, if let people come in to, to work, that's a consensual relationship. If one person wants to work for somebody and they want that person to work for them, the idea that the government is sort of inserting itself is just it seems to me perverse. Uh, 
You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of hardworking people from other places that want to come here, and we throw lots of barriers. And, you know, the biggest danger to me will be when the brain drain starts going in the other direction. Right now, we have a brain drain coming from a lot of other places in the world, and a lot of that is because we accept the best and the brightest. And, you know, we also accept people who are, you know, good, hardworking people. Obviously, he's we, talking about making it merit-based as opposed to family-based, and that would be good too. Uh, but I'm not sure. I, you know, the reason I say that is because uh, up until oh, the early night, early part of the, of the of the 20th century, we had no immigration uh, mm -hmm. quotas of, of any kind whatsoever. The first immigration were against, uh, quotas were against the Chinese because we were worried about the the Chinese that worked on the railroad taking over in California. Those were the you know the anti-Chinese. Uh, immigration controls were the first one that we had. But as far as Europe is concerned, not until the 1920s did we have any immigration control whatsoever. And as a result, we got whoever wanted to come over, including not necessarily the best and the brightest. It, it was the people who were getting uh, screwed in their home countries. Exactly, but they, I guess they, they, they were hard workers, and the idea was you didn't have the malincentives to come. Exactly, there was no um, welfare guarantee, no uh, ready waiting uh, job for you, or or or, or even worse, uh, no job, but 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 uh, sustenance at the, at the you know at the at the public trough. That didn't occur. Now we have, to a certain extent, we have a problem with malincentives. Mm -hmm. yes. I, there are um, obviously burdens placed by low-income, non-English-speaking people that come them. right. But I mean, I, I'm thinking primarily the healthcare system and the education system. And I think the the cost again, to again the, not if we don't pay for them. right. But the way the system is set up right now, there is. I mean, it slows down everybody when you, a public school system is, you know educating people that don't speak English. I mean, the kids that do you know, speak I'm English are sure. going to suffer. My mother uh, was born of immigrant parents, Dutch. She went to school at age six, first grade, not knowing a word of English. And everybody else in her class knew English. She was valedictorian of her class. I'm not sure and spoke perfect English because right. she learned it from native speakers. As and she to taught her, her parents. As opposed to her parents who spoke with an accent, my grandparents. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the situation. Right. If kids are immersed in English, I think they'll do just fine. I well agree. Today. I support English immersion education. Sure. Yeah. But, but let's even assume that, that that is a problem in the schools. Then the issue is it's more of a problem because of the schools, the exactly. way we have the schools organized. I mean, if we had competition in schools, you could have schools that pop up to deal with people with those constraints. And, and you know, the idea we're trying to do one size fits all, and that is That's a very bad fit everywhere. And the whole idea of immigration, I think you said it very nicely, Jason, if a Juan in, uh, in uh, Tijuana is born uh, 100 yards away from John in, in San Diego, why can't they employ each other or trade with each other? It's without consensual the relationship. Without the government getting involved. That's just nonsense. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's politicians, dead politicians and dead generals from a generation or two ago making rules about who can trade with who today. It's absolutely insane. Well, and I mean, I'm going to sound like an old guy now, but like when I was a kid, I worked in a couple restaurants in high school and I, were, I did landscaping work and I was a paper boy. And these are just jobs that probably most people my age did when they were kids and now somehow everybody has to go to college and everybody's going to get a desk job and we're all too good for that so we have this basically in california we have a brown underclass that does the dirty work and it's true across the country i mean if you look at the meat packing business in the midwest or anywhere there's an agricultural industry there's um you know but that's nothing new it was the poles and the italians a couple generations right ago. But and, and, and so the, the argument my, my I'm making is we as a society, because of our wealth, um, have we really don't do our job. We don't expect our kids to do those jobs. We don't. We aspire to more, or you can call it aspiration, or you can just call it hoity-toity. Whatever. We're too good for it. So there's a lot of people coming into this country doing stuff that needs to be done that we just don't do ourselves anymore. We're not very self-reliant as a nation. We're, it's a very specialized country, and we want to be lawyers or doctors or business people or whatever. We don't want to be picking fruit and scrubbing dishes and you know butchering cattle or pogs or any of that stuff or cleaning motel rooms. 
we hire people and that that's work that needs to be done and we're not willing to do it ourselves basically <laughs> well, the sad thing is almost all of the ills that people associate, the crimes of, uh, that happen along the border, that's because we've created a black market, you know, in immigration or in, in labor at the moment. And, you know, when you make things illegal and people want to engage in these consensual relationships, it, it, you know, this is the problem, you know. So it's, it's... Well, and the other thing, I mean, if you take a look at the statistics, the immigrant population is a lot more law-abiding than Native American population. That's just, that's just fact. Partly because they're afraid they're going to get deported. Exactly. I mean, well, yeah. that may be part of it, but even so, they're you know they're they're, they're here to work. They're not yeah. here, they're not here to do anything yeah. else. Um, the 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 Trump campaign was notorious for talking about how uh, terrible uh, our trade relationship with, uh, in particular, China was. Uh, Trump was talking about uh, you know. China as a currency manipulator, China not trading fairly, uh, get rid of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, whatever, you know, the trade agreement, don't sign a new one, do bilateral deals. And I mean, he went off and went really xenophobic and got a lot of votes because of going xenophobic on, on, on international trade, particularly with China. When uh, President Xi Jinping came to China, or came to the United States to visit with Trump about six months ago, uh, they had a little parley in at Mar-a-Lago and decided that uh, the well Trump they told, cake didn't they, they some cake. big story about the know. eating cake but anyway uh, Trump told uh, told uh, G that if you put the hammer down on North Korea you know make them quit lobbing half-assed missiles at us we'll you know go easy with you on trade you got six months well the six months have passed and. Kim Jong-un, or whatever his name is, is still lobbing uh, 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 ineffectual missiles uh, in, out into the ocean uh, and has a nuclear bomb, supposedly. Uh, and uh, now Trump is, is, is proposing steel tariffs. He's proposing a crackdown on international trade with China. Is this going to work, or are we starting trade wars that could uh, blossom into something even worse? Um, as a diplomatic tool, um, it's... A tr you know, tariffs are almost an act of war, and they're certainly they certainly will have um, consequences, negative consequences for us as consumers that are relatively obvious. Um, most of I think we only import in this country about twenty five percent of our steel, but you know the big the only people that would benefit from this are the people the U.S. domestic producers of steel. And they're operating at below full capacity right now. And the people right who will not benefit are the people the who people buy steel. that use steel, use and that would be and the that's, automakers that's, that's and everything. That's a lot more people. Price would go up for all the steel car prices. Well, I can't think of something that's benefited the world more than free trade and and brought China along more into uh, human rights and everything. You know, Ronald Reagan had a saying that was just wonderful. It's a wonderful quote, and he said, "We're in the same boat with our trading partners. You know, if one of them shoots a hole in the boat." You know, know yeah, exactly. You don't turn around and shoot another hole in the boat just to show them who's tough. That's yeah. the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, on those famous last words. Thank you very much for being part of the show. This is the Libertarian Counterpoint.